Welcome um, to all of you listening to this webinar presented to you by the Urban Real Estate Research Unit at UCT and Quinn Online. Um, this is the last of a series that we've been doing together over the past uh, two months, I would say, uh, if not longer, where we've looked at different aspects of the commercial property market and of course, residential interspersed uh, in between. What we decided to do in this uh, webinar is to take an international view on, on the market. Um, many South African funds at the moment, REITs are, are invested uh, across the globe. And it's, it's something that we want to unpack uh, this afternoon. The team this afternoon, um, we have uh, Tom Mundy with us from JLL, uh, well known to the South African property market. Uh, but uh, Tom heads JLL's Sub-Saharan Africa International Capital Group based in Johannesburg uh, and has the oversight of the capital strategies and transactions um, in and outside of sub-Saharan Africa with enormous experience uh, both uh, from the, the London office for many years, also a strong um, understanding of uh, the East European markets, especially uh, the Russian market where Tom spent some time in the market. Um, more, more recently, um, Tom Mendy and JLL uh, have been involved in a number of large tran transactions um, and some of them um, with the Westport Fund as a typical example, transactions there um, and uh, with, with Redefine as well, but uh, just two names where some international transactions have happened, but advising very much on um, transactions also beyond those markets, but also in Africa itself. So a very broad understanding of the markets. And uh, I'm delighted to have you among us. Uh, thank you very much for, for find, finding the time, especially now when uh, the discussions are about fundamentals at, at the moment. It is about the real estate story. It is about vacancies. It is where, what sectors that we go to. Um, we also have uh, with us Rob McGaffin, who has co-hosted the series with me over the last uh, uh, weeks. We, we've largely been doing this as a duet. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, and we'll be doing that again uh, in the time that we have in front of us. Uh, we'll both be raising the question and facilitating the, se the, the session. And um, Rob McGaffin, of course, known to many of you in South Africa, um, uh, is at the Urban Real Estate Research Unit, and it is in that capacity that he's with us as well, and that we are doing this. And then we also have from Coin Online, Kayla Van Milk. Kayla, so thank you very much uh, for being the, the, the co-partner in this endeavor. Uh, um, and uh, for, for making technologies available and for hosting. So very much uh, great thank you to you and your team. Okay, um, I thought that what we would do in the time that we have ahead is look a bit at the markets, but I thought that what we do is look a bit at the past um, first enter into a discussion which says, why overseas? Uh, why have our funds gone overseas? Uh, what was so attractive? And, and again, let's be sure that when we say overseas, it includes our continent as well. Uh, um, there are markets uh, in West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, Central Africa, which all have their, their opportunities. But invariably funds have, uh, have gone beyond South African borders. Um, so I thought what we'd do is maybe unpack that first. And then what we'll do is look a bit at the market at present, uh, 
look at some of the trends that we are seeing in, in global real estate uh, uh, markets, both in terms of geographies as well as the sectors uh, that we're looking at. And let's maybe see whether, uh, I, I've heard people say to me that uh, you can be overseas but in the wrong sector. Uh, uh, it's not just a matter of, of going, going off to other geographies, but you could get it totally wrong if you haven't focused on the uh, areas. And I suppose that's where JLL, with well represented globally, can give us a view. And then I thought we'd end up with a discussion on the future. What does the future look like as, we, as these uh, markets evolve, as the South African uh, markets evolve? Um, we'll go into that. So Tom, th th thank, th thank you very, very much. And um, I, I suppose, as, as I said, uh, what is the case or what has been the case for, for saying, let's go to overseas? I mean, some some investors were baffled by countries that they'd never heard of before, uh, uh, suddenly becoming a, a sort of a investment proposition. Um, and I suppose, let's unpack that. And why, why attractive to South African investors in particular? You know, um, what made us, what made these markets so interesting? Oh. So, so it's a very good question to start with. And I think the, the way I, I look at South Africa, having come from other markets and into this, uh, into this country, is the, the defining feature for me about South Africa. What makes South Africa different and why do South African real estate markets behave the way they do vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with international markets? For me, it all comes down to the way that capital behaves, the mediation of capital. You've got two um, components in this discussion. One is the fact that South Africa has a lot of RAND liquidity. It has a very high proportion of pension fund assets under management relative to GDP. It has a level of, of liquidity that's not dissimilar to the more developed and advanced markets that we would see in, 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 in Western Europe, Scandinavia, Denmark, those kinds of countries. Now, the other side to that equation is the fact that this capital has concentrated itself in real estate investment trusts and listed property funds. Uh, now, that has therefore meant that there's a lot of liquidity sitting in quite a tight space, and there's a requirement for that liquidity to generate a return. Everything in South Africa is driven, therefore, by this very high concentration of real estate liquidity sitting in the listed property space. It's extremely high. And I, I'm not sure that people really have this discussion as much as they should, about 22 to 23%, I'm using EPRA's numbers, of um, commercial real estate in South Africa sits in the listed property funds. Now in Europe or in developed markets, Europe and the US, it's between five, six and a half percent. So it's a very high level uh, in concentration within the listed property funds. And if you look at those listed property funds, how much of that real estate is held of their, of their real estate exposure is held offshore, but it's around 50%. So it's a, it's a really, really high concentration of liquidity. It's a high concentration in the REITs, and then it's a high concentration offshore. And of course, Francois, you, you raised the good point that offshore doesn't necessarily mean Europe and, and Australia, it also means sub-Saharan Africa. And I think you have to deal with those two components separately. But the defining feature of why this capital goes offshore is very clear. It's to generate returns with a one year forward view for dividends and for distribution. And that's how every property fund in this country is judged. And that's what's driven uh, the, the, the expansion mm -hmm. abroad. Um, and it's something that's happened in a relatively short period of time. That concentration has happened within the last, obviously as, as REITs were formed in the last you know, seven or eight years or so. And it's been a rush offshore. And what we've seen in the last, uh, in the last uh, two years is it's, it's, it's really slowed down. And that's a discussion perhaps for later in this conversation. But this offshoring story, there's been a, yes, there was a paradigm shift as the REITs were formed in South Africa to going offshore. And I should say, it's not just the REITs. I mean, a lot of the, the family offices and private equity as such as it exists in South Africa has gone offshore. Um, but in the last couple of years, 18 months, really, it's, it's really slowed down. You no, know, but it's a fraction of what it was. Um, 
So in my mind, to summarize all of that, everything in South Africa is driven by short-term returns. Yeah. Rob, a question there, just to follow up. Tom, why do you think we have such a significant uh, concentration in the, the listed funds, kind of vis-a-vis -vis those other countries you mentioned? There's a paradox in South Africa where we have um, developed um, relatively well-regulated financial markets. We have a very good functioning stock exchange. We have a very, very poor intermediation of real estate capital. If you look at the model in Europe or in the US, you have the institutional liquidity going via a combination of private equity, closed end funds, family offices, high net worths, REITs, whatever it may be. REITs are just a proportion of that. In South Africa, the mediation of that capital is not, it's not as developed. We think it's developed, but actually it isn't. Uh -huh. Closed end funds don't exist in South Africa, actually. We don't have a Brookfield, we don't have a Blackstone. The money goes from the pension funds, where? To the REITs, or they own the property themselves. What we don't have is private equity, what we don't have is closed end funds. So this capital, this huge liquidity has to go somewhere. Yeah. And okay. it's gone into a concentration, in my mind, an over-concentration into equities. Uh, and it needs now to come back, is, is my, 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 my I, I, would, I would posit in this forum that that's what needs to change. So it's a concentration because actually the structures around the capital are not in place in South Africa in the way that they are in developed markets. And that in itself has ramifications because it means that product hasn't developed in line with the way the mediation of capital has, mm. uh, has developed. You know, it's why we have so much real estate in, in, in traditional um, sectors, you know, retail, uh, office, mm. industrial, practically nothing, um, no conduit for institutional capital to access alternative asset classes. So it's a, it's a yes, we, 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 have, we have a stock market, we have a financial services authority, no, we, have, we, we, we have a structure that on, the, on the, uh, the top level looks very much like what we might get in, in Europe or even to an extent emerging Europe. Well, underneath, no. very, uh, very, very um, nascent, I would say. Um, okay. If we just look also back, in your view, what about the fundamentals that, that drove investors? I mean, you know, you, you, you hear, you know, well, borrowing is cheap. Go, go, go off to Central Europe and you can get yourself a yield of 9% and it all looks good and you played around. Uh, maybe do we have a slightly risk, different risk return profile than the German investor has or, 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 or others? I mean, what is it about the fundamentals that's, that drove this, that, that has been driving this game? Uh, and uh, maybe we can talk yeah. later, and, and has that changed? Uh. So there's a couple of points there. I mean, the, 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 the primary point is, of course, that and I suppose it goes back to what I was saying just now, is that South Africa perhaps isn't as developed as it, as it would present itself as being. You know, how does that manifest itself? Well, we have relatively high interest rates. You know, we don't have the same monetary policy response in South Africa that we've had in, in, in Europe and in the States, particularly through this, this cycle. How, what does that mean? Well, it means, therefore, that our, you know, our, our yield gap is, 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 is negative, whereas in other markets it's positive, particularly in, yeah. in Europe and particularly in Eastern Europe. So the, 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 the premise of South African real estate is to balance the negative yield gap with rental growth. So we have a mindset in South Africa where it's all about rental. Everything has to be justified on the basis of rental growth. Yeah. Um, where, you know, it's actually very hard to find rental growth in real terms in South Africa. And let's not kid ourselves. It has been for quite a long time, oh, actually. You know, yeah. we, we, we pretend that escalations are rental growth. That they're not, actually. Now, therefore, the South African mindset has to put itself back a little bit and go back to the traditional forms of, you know, real estate investing as we would do in a sort of in a, in a, in a Western European or US sense and look for that yield gap. Coupled with that is in my mind what is a what is actually quite a good risk sort of um, uh, risk on trading mentality that the old school South African real estate investors, the pioneers, the, the Mark Wainers, were very, very good at finding trades. You know, they're traders. So if you take a step away from South Africa and you say, well, where's the trade? Clearly the trade was in Eastern Europe at a time when yeah. institutional capital in Europe, the German capital, the big capital sources, were not going into these markets. Now, mm -hmm. that was 
a while ago. You know, since this, you know, since we're talking about history now, no. you know, 2014 was a long time ago, 2015, 2016. 2019, 2020, well, it's a much, much more co competitive market than it was. Ah. There's Korean money coming in. There's, oh. It's very hard for South Africans to compete. And also that yield gap is, it's still positive because inflation has been moving down. It is, it's, pretty, it's pretty low in Europe. And oh. Interest rates have come down and the yield gap has stayed pretty healthy. Um, but it has become a much more competitive place. There's not a lot of product. It's much harder. You can't just go into into into, into Poland and, and pick up any old uh, shopping centre. And then, so, uh, yeah. and then just that, sorry. And then just and then Rob, um, I don't want to lose the African story here. Um, ah, about close to a decade ago, I suppose uh, Africa was the place to go. We're now suddenly seeing the trekkers and others maybe not quite calling it a day, but quite a number of our retailers have not seen the, the, the success story that they were betting on. Um, some investors came back with a tail between their legs a bit. Um, is this a commodity story at the end of the day? Is this, do you, do you follow that when exploration in Kenya or all those exploration companies that were sitting in Kenya suddenly have nothing to explore? That, that does that bring this whole thing to an end? Um, Look, that, I mean, the rest of Africa, so I, I still, I would still go back to the story that everything is driven off growth, rental growth. But the balance in sub Saharan Africa, so when we say sub Saharan Africa, what we mean is Nigeria, Ghana, Zambia, Mozambique. Namibia to an extent, but so small in Namibia. But there are a couple of South African routes high profit got exposure there. Um, to me, it was driven, it's that that move into those markets was, was clustered around a time when the oil price was was looking pretty good. It was quite late cycle, as is always the way, because the movement into those markets was often predicated on the, the desire of the of, of, of the large retailers, the games and the shop rights and the Woolworths to an extent to get into those markets. So it's still a story that's predicated on growth. Uh, the, the yield gap story doesn't quite measure up in sub-Saharan Africa as well as in the same way that doesn't quite in South Africa because you're dealing in dollars. Dollars are not, you know, are quite hard to source in these, you know, for the debt side, you're quite hard to source in these countries. Um, the leases are in dollars, that helps, but you've got a kind of currency mismatch. For me, therefore, it was much more about uh, how is the actual economy doing and how, um, how does rental, how, how do those rental rates grow? And what is the saturation in those markets of existing products? And if you look across all those markets, and I'd, I'd actually posit that it's still the case that, you know, although South South Africa is, is very concentrated in traditional, over concentrated in traditional retail, in traditional formats such as such as retail, um, in those markets, it's still this Ghana and Nigeria. There still isn't that much product, oh. mm -hmm. and you've got growing con, you've got growing demographics, and okay, there's an argument around that, which is slightly separate, but. You've got a, you've got undersupply. You've got um, strong demographics in the cities. Sure. You've got growing middle class, etc. I think all that the South African um, South Africans got wrong in those markets, and as you're right, you know, quite a lot of capital is coming out. You know, the strategies have changed. Is that I think there wasn't sufficient um, focus on the strong cyclicality of those markets, the, the strongly pro-cyclical fiscal policies that you see in markets like Nigeria. You know, coming from a background like, like Russia, which are very similar actually, uh, Nigeria is it's even, it's an even tighter, more extreme cycle. Um, now, if you couple that with the way that the funds behave, either REITs that require um, distribution growth or need to be able to prove distribution growth on an annual basis, or a number of closed-end funds, the five-year closed-end fund private equity model doesn't work in sub-Saharan Africa because you need to ride through the cycle. And if you have a couple of years of poor distribution growth, if you're a REIT, investors don't have tolerance for that. Wow. And that's, that, again, that goes back to this kind of unfortunate position where Africa doesn't necessarily have the correct structures to develop those markets. And probably then that goes back to a requirement for institutional capital, regional institutional capital, to... Um, grow and mature to um, de-risk that kind of money. There, I mean, investing yeah. in the type of deals you've been involved with. I mean, there's, there's the yeah. demand. Uh, I mean, for yeah. prime property. Uh, uh, if we look at the Westport portfolio and a few others, I mean, there are, uh, there are properties out there. 
Rob, go for it. Just one question. I just wanted to pull back, come back to, to just the, the discussion before with the late entry of some of the European uh, players into the the markets that the South Africans had got into relatively early. Is there a reason why the Germans, etc., took that long to get into those markets? I, I mean, I know Francois and I remember back in about 2014 or 15 going, what do we know in the tip of Africa about uh, Poland that the Germans don't know? You I know what I mean? We were a bit more, more worried about this. I'm, I'm, I was interested to hear how you say they have moved into those markets now and they're a far more competitive market uh, now. But I'm intrigued to know why there was a lag uh, with them going in. But, 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 but Rob, just before, I, I think where our discussion was also at the time is, do we have a different risk return profile? You know. Uh, at, at, at nine, those sort of returns, we're willing to take that risk uh, of those markets um, because we can deal with risk. Uh, you know, anyway, Tom, let's, let's get your view on it. It's, a, it's semantics, but I think it's an important one. So I, I wouldn't say it's about willingness to take those risks. It's a requirement to take those risks because the South African investor expects it. Yeah. That's the German investor expect something else. They expect the uh, preservation of their capital. So, now, yeah. Germans have always been active in these markets. You know, we, they have been. I mean, Germans, you know, German, um, uh, you know, retail um, volumes in, 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 in Eastern Europe have always been around this sort of billion to billion and a half dollars wow. per annum. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they are active in those markets. Okay. But I do think there's a, there's a, but that, that there's, there's a, there's a, a mindset, I think, where South Africa, as I, as I probably go back to this point about understanding um, or being traders, is that there, this is a transitional, this is a market in transition, this is essentially a transitional economy, it's taking a bit, bit longer to transition than perhaps we've hoped it might. Um, but I think there's an affinity to those markets. And I think if you look at the way that um, institutional capital in Europe has treated Eastern European markets up until you know, the last year or so, there's a typical kind of reticence, I think, towards, towards risk. Now, a lot of that has changed. Um, with uh, the relationship that those countries have with, with Europe, um, particularly um, European uh, legal norms. Uh, you know, the ECJ yeah. is extremely important, you know, to underwrite risk in those countries. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just that, uh, you know, where those are, those are countries where there's traditionally growth. And I think South Africans look for growth, whereas the, the German and the UK, yes, you want growth, but you want that preservation of capital. Um, Tom, there's also a lot of home market bias, yeah. by the way. I would say that's something that's also very important. If you look at the way that German institutional capital behaves in UK and French, huge amounts of home market bias. Your quick view. Where, suppose one were to go and look at other markets at the moment. Uh, what's the lie of the land at the moment? What, where are we sectorally a bit with geographies? Uh, has the world fundamentally changed in the past 12 months? I suppose the whole world is sitting with low growth rates, interest rates, lowest we've seen for, there's not much room for monetary policy left, I guess, in many yeah. countries. I mean, where, where are we? A quick roundup, then, and then after that, we'll look at what the future could look like. Okay, so, we can view that question from a South African perspective, or we can view it from a global perspective. Um, Let's take the South African perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the lie of the land if you're if you're if you're South African? Well, first, of course, the we can deal with the domestic narrative, which is that it's an extremely challenging market in South Africa right now, and I don't think we can get away from that. It's challenging, however, only in the sectors to my mind, where there is a combination of oversupply um, and a narrative, a broader international narrative, which runs against the theme. So if you look at South Africa, mar uh, sectors like retail, on face value, look extremely challenged. We, kn we know that it's a function of you know, the fact that there's 23 million square meters of, 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 of shopping center space in South Africa. That's probably, you know, realistically, we need to lose about 10 million to actually get to a level of saturation, which would be more in line with Eastern European markets, which is probably where we should be. So there's far too much supply. Um, I think in offices, it's the same story. You know, we, we've, we've got a worrying uptick in the last 18 months, pre-COVID, of 
um, prime great uh, prime space in, in Rosebank or Sands and in Johannesburg. Um, now that uh, that was worrying before COVID. It's very worrying now, um, and I I've always felt kind of comfortable that South Africa has two stories in offices. One is that okay. B grade and C grade products is, 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 is defunct and that'll fix itself, but Prime is doing well. And now I think that that narrative has changed quite substantially and COVID is accelerating that. We don't have um, uh, real evidence of strong positive net absorption, which is what you need in these markets really to, to generate rental growth, particularly with the quantity of products. Industrial, again, I think it's, it depends what you're doing. Generally speaking, I think industrial could be quite interesting in South Africa, particularly if it fits into the last mile logistics narrative, which is popular all over the world. Now, across all of those, however, there are a couple of themes which I think South Africans should bear in mind. First of all, retail is not defunct. Certain areas of retail are defunct. And I know it's a, it's a bit of a chestnut at the moment, but there is a township rural retail story in South Africa. That's where the growth is. We are way behind in South Africa on the e-commerce trend that we've seen in, in, in Europe. We will get there in the end, but there are a number of factors. You know, financial inclusion is relatively weak in South Africa. Um, delivery costs are relatively high. You know, it, it's, it's, it's expensive to, to, to do this, you know, when you can just go to your local store around the corner. It's arguably not a sector that's actually oversupplied. There's possibilities for rental growth because rent to sales ratios are relatively low compared to the big super regionals. There's lots of little stories there you can pick out, which give me some confidence that that's actually quite an interesting area. Um, and particularly if you combine that to the fact that there's so much retail in South Africa that trades in the listed property space and is now trading at a significant discount to NAV, that's potentially an interesting trade when you account for the fact that monetary policy has shifted down. That's more than probably cushioned the impact of the of, of, of declining rental rates across the broader um, retail space. Uh, but the big story, I think, for South Africa, and that goes to the last point I made about industrial, is that the area that South Africa has not grown in because of the way that capital has been mediated is the alternative space. Just, just not there. Now, if you look at the European market, and that goes to my point about my, my point that I'm going to make about Europe is that the market is so much more diverse. In Europe, actually, and also in the US, the big um, access points for the retail investor are actually the more diversified products. It's, it's student housing, or it's, it's healthcare, it's, it's self-storage, it's, it's, it's towers, it's data centers. All of those have proven really defensive and resilient through um, this period of uncertainty generated by COVID. I know this isn't necessarily a discussion around COVID, but COVID has accelerated these trends. If you invest in, in real estate products in South Africa, you don't get that choice. Yes, there's, there's, a, there's one self-storage fund, but 40 something percent of his exposure is in the UK. Now, that for me, and, and it's important not to beat up on the South African real estate story, because those are the areas that potentially are really, are really exciting. We have a demographic story here, and we have an undersupply story. The key is to get that capital to go into those areas. Now that brings me on to my global view about what's interesting at the moment. Now, globally, there is a massive amount of liquidity. This dry powder from real estate story that it has been going for years now, and you know, $350 billion of, of dry powder for real estate. What it's doing is it's pushing, it, it's pushing strategies which focus more on opportunistic and value add investing, and therefore push liquidity into these areas, into these sectors which are non-traditional. And those sectors are maturing. Um, where is capital flowing right now? It's flowing into healthcare. It's flowing into student. Well, student housing is a little bit is a little bit more complex at the moment with COVID, but it's flowing into healthcare. It's flowing into last mile logistics. If you look at the big capital raises at the moment, all in last mile logistics. If you look at the penetration of last mile logistics within the overall industrial sector, it's still relatively low, even in relatively mature markets like Australia or New Zealand. So what we're seeing is uncertainty in retail, but retail product that's positioned towards omni-channel retail or fits into this last mile just logistics story is doing very well. Alternatives generally are doing very well. Offices, good product in good locations still doing well, but there is a lot of uncertainty and I don't think that's going to be fixed anytime soon. Um, and that's generally, and that's the juxtaposition between South Africa and the other markets for me. Fascinating, absolutely. Rob, did you want to add something there? I, I just wanted to have a follow-up question with Tom. Tom, uh, your point about 
alternatives in South Africa? Is there the argument that we just don't have the, the scale in South Africa to, to go to those alternatives? I mean, is that the reason why we don't? Whereas if you have a market like kind of European market or US market, sure, those alternative markets are actually huge. Where in South Africa, they might be perceived as being quite small. Absolutely. And I suppose the question is, have any of our funds gone into alternatives anywhere else in the world? So it's a both very good questions. I mean, in terms of liquidity, the liquidity is there. Um, you know, why has, why has that liquidity gone into retail? Because it's always the way, actually, if you look at the European model, retail comes first. It's, it's, it's yeah. the easiest way to generate returns on a year-on-year know, -year basis. Is there the potential for growth in areas like data centers or in student housing? Well, I mean, the evidence suggests that yes, there is actually. I mean, that we're coming from an extremely low base. I mean, data center growth in, across the African continent is actually extremely strong. I mean, we're, we're, we have issues around, around ESCOM and things which make those particular issues around data centers a little bit more challenging. But these are so nascent, the, the base level is so low. Um, even student housing, you know, we see a huge amount where there is interest um, from international capital, particularly the, um, the DFIs, it's in student housing. And student housing is, is pretty hot actually in South Africa right now. So I think for the, given the almost complete absence of this product, uh, the institutional grade, um, and that there is a reasonable amount of liquidity, Yes, I think there is interest. And have these, have South Africans gone into these sectors internationally? Well, I mean, to an extent, yes, they have. And they've been quite successful at doing it. I mean, the obvious one is, is Redefine's um, Australian student housing portfolio, which was did extremely well. Um, I mean, you could even argue that, that, um, that going back, back in the day, that, that Redefine's you know, foray into, into Polish industrial. I mean, industrial in Poland, was, that was maybe not quite opportunistic certainly sort of value add levels of, of you know, that, so you know I, I don't think there's a there's a question mark about the ability of South African capital to sort of take risk or be pioneers I think it's just been easier to kind of get away with it in retail for the last you know five or six years and that's that's I think what should, but, but should really come, I, I've heard the argument that has said well medical care hotels data are also attractive because that's the only place you're going to get a long-term lease you know, if you're looking for something longer than a one-year lease or two-year lease, um, sure, it's a triple net lease, uh, uh, but it's, you've, you've got some opportunity to, to have a bit of a longer lease on the back of that. I don't know how true it is. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I think if you were to talk to the, the, the debt providers uh, in Africa, yeah. they would welcome the opportunity to, to diversify their portfolio as well. And I think when it all comes down to essentially the strength of your covenant, uh, you know, why would you, why would you not want to balance your, your, your sort of short-term retail exposure with a, a longer term, perhaps you know, potentially dollarized, potentially, you know, more stable lease structure, <laughs> even if you're potentially limiting your returns. But that would take um, some a slight shift in mentality from the South African investor. And, you know, we've gone, we, we, we've gone that way. You know, we're, we're already seeing deferrals of, of, of dividends and uh, announcements through the COVID process. And I say, okay, um, in the few minutes that we do have left, um, the future. I think, Tom, you've already indicated one or two indications. We've seen a slowdown in some of the international investment if we compare what's happened. Um, and look, I don't want to sound alarmist here, but have we shifted to a view which says, I'm selling some of my South African again, we do need to have somebody on the flip side. Uh, uh, this is not about raising more capital to go and do things, but am I, is this a portfolio? These, are these rejigging the portfolio of it? Uh, in what's, what's in there? What's, what do I get out? What do I get in? Anyway, uh, maybe just your views on what could, what could the future look like? I think it's actually, in, in many ways, it's, 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 quite, it's quite an exciting time in South African real estate. You know, I think the COVID has accelerated some trends that we've seen building up. You know, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a list of them, actually. You know, I'll go through them if you like. <laughs> the first is that I think for the first time, South African investors, South African uh, real estate investors, let's put it like that, very broad terminology, 
are going to have to have a much more realistic view of valuations. What are cap rates? What are initial yields? What, what is actually going on? Like proper scrutiny. And I don't think that that's really been happening. I, I'll leave okay. it at that. Okay. I think that a lot more visibility on, okay. uh, on data, I think we'll have a lot more visibility and yeah. understanding of yields, of rental growth. That's exciting. And a bit um, of ESG now, in between? Okay. I'd, like to say, I'd like to say we should. Like, absolutely, it's the case in European markets that ESG, yeah. impact investing, however you do, it, it, the, the reason why it's making sense is because there's absolutely clear evidence that if you've got um, uh, sustainability built into your building, you're getting better rental growth and okay. you're getting a better price when you sell it at the end of the cycle. Okay. I don't think we're there yet in South Africa, but I think we will get there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the rebalancing of portfolios, and it slightly goes back to my valuation issue, is that there's much more scrutiny now. You can't, get, you can't get away with it anymore. So I think that the offshore strategy, for since this is a discussion about the internationalization oh, of African capital, absolutely. I think there's going to be a shift now to focus on the domestic portfolio. In fact, to some extent, we've already seen it. It's great if you've got that offshore exposure, you'll stick with it, um, even if it's not entirely cool, because it's probably doing quite well. And generally speaking, South African acquisitions abroad have done well. But now it's a question of shifting back onto your onshore strategy, making sure that your, your, your product is clean, clean shareholding structures, clean, everything needs to be clean and understandable. It's not always been the case in South Africa. Um, a really, really focused investment strategy. You, know, you don't want anything that's non-core to your, to your central story. And if you look at the, um, the investors who've been most successful, actually, it's because they've had very clear structures. I mean, I mean this globally, not necessarily in South Africa. Um, as part of getting to that process, and that, first of all, this goes to your point, the way that real estate trades in South Africa, I think is gonna fundamentally change. You know, and we're already starting to see it, where and there's just a lot more, there's more core product um, coming to the market. I don't think it's necessarily easy to sell, but it's a lot easier to sell than the poor product. You know, BC grade mm -hmm. stuff is actually very, very hard to sell in this market. Right. A good quality core product in the right location that's trading well, just like we see in European markets. Right. Now the interesting thing about when you've got such a high concentration of retainership, you've got these long-term capital vehicles, stuff doesn't trade. If you look at the, 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 the history of, of acquisitions in South Africa. The REITs bought everything up from 2014 to 2018. Everything dominated by REITs. That wasn't the case in Europe. That slowed down the last 18 months or so. Mm. REITs haven't been buying anything in South Africa, not really. Mm. Not even really trading between themselves. There's been an increase, significant increase in private, private capital that's entering the market at this stage. So my, I would posit that the dominance of the REITs in South Africa is going to wane. I think the smaller REITs, I wouldn't be surprised to see delistings. I mean, there's been delistings happening across the JSC, the broader market, since you know, God knows when. I mean, it's a constant mm -hmm. process of delisting in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I think that'll channel itself into, uh, into the, the real estate space, which is probably a good thing. And as that happens, more good quality product will come to the market. Now that may provide the channels for the, the, the growth or the, the, the building of, of a closed end funds, the, more an active role for private equity, family offices maybe can get involved and we'll start to see, you know, more trading. And that's a very, that again is good because it brings visibility. It means there's proper scrutiny over pricing. The cap rate isn't a made up oh. number, it's an actual first year. <laughs> Rob, Rob, I know you've been waiting, Verified. you've been waiting on the side. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> your question, I think we're going to start wrapping up straight after that. Uh, uh, this, is, this is music to my ears, actually. Um, so so, um, so there's, if, if, if you say that the growth story is over, you know, in other words, the South African real estate market relied on that growth story for it to make sense. If you look at the economy, et cetera, well, we haven't had that growth up till now anyway, but we're probably going to have less of it going forward. In order to reduce that negative yield gap, I mean, are we going to get a revaluation of properties? Because it's a big argument that properties in South Africa have just been overpriced for too long. So the challenge is, um, is this, uh, how sustainable is a positive yield gap? Maybe that's the way to look at it. Um, 
So I think you'll see, at the moment, you're seeing two dynamics. You're seeing an outward shift in yields, or an acceleration of an outward shift in yields. So that's, that's one side of the equation. Um, and on the other side of the equation is your financing costs, or whatever is predicated by the, right, the central right, bank. Okay. And that's what's, that's what's moved out. Now, as we go through this cycle, it's unlikely that we're going to keep policy rates as low for so long, because inflation sure. is going to start to kick in, which is going to erode that yeah. gap. Yeah. Now, that's, that's the that's the challenge. Um, probably, therefore, what that means is you start to then need to concentrate on, so say you're, you're an opportunistic investor, you're saying, okay, well, there's a positive yield gap in South Africa, let's pile in there. The, uh, the product that you will look at has to be the product which can grow um, in line with any kind of recovery or rental, rate, rent, rental rates can grow in line with any recovery in the broader economy, which is why I find the, the, the story around rural and township retail actually quite interesting because you've got the opportunity for rental growth, for example. So it's, it's, not a, it's not clear cut. I don't think we're going to move into a territory of positive yield gap you know, forever in the European sense, but it might just provide a spur and impetus. Um, Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we, it's time to wrap up. This went super fast. And I think we covered uh, a lot of ground, but I, but 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 really, Tom, thank you very much for for those insights. And you know, I, I really walk walk away from this discussion. Also, I never quite thought of the concentration that, and how much of our properties are actually in the listed uh, environment. You know, and I suppose on your last comments, which are interesting, is that could we see a bit of private capital, could we start seeing a, a, a different, uh, it may well create opportunities for different investors, uh, uh, BE investors and others to, to enter into a, a market, which many would have argued was fairly closed, of course, you know. Um, so I think that that's, uh, that is great. I think what we've really seen is that movement that has happened uh, overseas and I think Tom, what you rightly indicated, these are not just financial, these are structural issues as well. So it's how we do our asset management that, uh, that influences uh, what we think about. And, uh, um, and of course, yes, the issue of not just the geographies, but uh, the sectors. There are many other sectors beyond office, retail, uh, and industrial. I suppose the industrial sector is starting to have its own segments. Uh, as well. So I think that's really interesting. I mean, look, I think you have to be optimistic in this in this country. And I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that there's there's some really good products in this country. There's some really good, you know, real estate funds, be they listed or non-listed, you know, that it's just, as you say, it's a question, I think, now of, 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 of waking up a little bit to reality and a bit of a structural change. And yeah. we could come out of this um, it might be a bit painful, but I think we'll come out of it really much, much stronger. That leads me to thank you all. Uh, Tom, Rob, Kayla as well, uh, for keeping the, the, also the technologies going, which I, it seems to have gone perfectly fine. So thank you very much. And uh, we've tried to listen to your instructions as well. So we got it done in time as well, or close to it. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this useful. Um, I think this is certainly one that my students at UCT will be listening to. Um, um, and th for those of you who followed uh, the series, the, the five uh, different webinars, thank you very much for following us uh, over the time. And uh, if, if you need anything further, regardless, of course, uh, uh, feel, feel free to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but feel free to speak to Tom at JLL, uh, who have extensive experience in, in global markets uh, and, and who really have a view from uh, one side of the world to the other, including Africa and South Africa. So thank, thank you very much. And I'd like to leave it at that. Thank you very much for, for listening. Mm -hmm.